You may begin your session. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Cordell McGarry, and I work with the Department of uh, Procurement Services and the uh, Certification and Compliance Division. And today's topic we'll be discussing will be uh, entitled the Professional Declaration of Eligibility Process. So the Professional Declaration of Eligibility Process is what we consider to be an innovative way of allowing uh, qualified professional attorneys and accountants with CPA status to take on the role of the certification officer uh, in the review, verification, and attestation of, a, of an applicant meeting the requirements to become certified as a minority owned business enterprise or woman owned business enterprise with the city of Chicago. So, in this particular instance, you would again take on the role of the certification officer uh, and doing the review recommendation of eligibility. That's done in accordance with the program guidelines for certification with the city of Chicago uh, for businesses that are involved in non construction contracts. And as you can see, we have several certification programs for minority women-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses, and businesses that are owned by people with disabilities. For purposes of the professional declaration eligibility process, we're going to focus only on minority and women-owned business enterprises. A link to the uh, regulations uh, is also listed on, on this page here. And the regulations are the guiding principles behind the, the process of certification. So. All professionals that are involved in this process should be acquainted with uh, the regulations for certification and the link that is shown below. So, who's eligible in terms of consideration for this process would be uh, firms that are involved in or seeking certification as a minority owned business and or woman owned business. These firms are not involved in construction. What we mean, we mean by that is that we're not involved in activities such as a general contractor or a uh, trade contractor, carpenter, electrician, plumber, uh, et cetera, they're involved in construction trades. Um, those, those individuals would not be eligible for consideration in the program. Likewise, if you're involved in, as, a, as a supplier or a distributor of goods and services, uh, this, this, this professional process would not be uh, eligible for a firm that are involved in that activity. Uh, we also look at um, required businesses that are seeking certification through this process to have not been previously denied for certification within the past three years or have sought certification only to withdraw their application within the last three years. Uh, and in some cases where businesses that may have already been certified with, with, as an MBE or WBE, but they haven't graduated the program within that three year term as well. What we mean by graduation generally we refer to the business uh, in terms of not being considered a small business uh, pursuant to business size standards that are again, required in our regulations. So the requirements as a licensed professional is that we would, uh, again, require you to be a practicing attorney or CPA licensed in the state of Illinois for at least three years. The professional should not have been involved or convicted uh, of matters concerning fraud or making false statements. And of course, the uh, attorney or CPA or professional should not have an ownership interest or be employed or have a familiar relationship with the company that they're representing or make a decision based on certification eligibility. So the professional basically, again, is stepping into the role of the certified officer or the certification officer with the city. So in, in this process, they will be involved in actually reviewing the application for certification that's been prepared by the applicant and all the documentation that's been provided as well to support that. Uh, in addition to the review of the documentation and application, we expect the professional to conduct an on-site visit interview with the business owners. And to the extent that that's possible uh, in today's environment, given pandemics, we do require at least a virtual or you know, on-site on visit interview in the event that that can't be done in person. Um, they will also be involved in preparing the summarization of, of the results of their review. It's a summary report. Uh, we, we ask that professionals tell the story about the basis for their recommendation. Tell us about the, the company, who they are, the ownership structure, what it is they do, who's involved in doing it, and whether they meet the standards of, of eligibility and pursuant to the regulations that we referred to earlier. And finally, we ask that the professional attest to their status as being a professional by providing us with a form that we call attestation 
then you're going to provide evidence of your credentials and the like. So once this process has been pretty much done, you prepared the summary review, you've done the on-site interview, the attestation, you reviewed all of the information, you're going to submit your recommendation electronically uh, to the city and receive, we will, we will receive it. And um, based upon, again, our, our, our review, we'll expedite this, we'll try to expedite the review uh, to grant you uh, or grant the, the, the client uh, certification uh, in the event of a denial, they'll also receive that. Uh, in, the, in the case that additional information is needed in order to verify the decision or recommendation of a professional, we will try to reach out to the professional and, and or the applicant to receive that additional information. In some cases, if an application is incomplete or has been submitted for review under this process, um, we will, of course, have to stop that and then go into the standard certification process, um, which would involve a certification officer with the city. So once you're certified or once the firm is certified with the city of Chicago as an MDE or WDE, that certification basically will remain effective for as long as the firm continues to meet the eligibility requirements. What we do require is that on an annual basis from the point of, of initial certification is that they provide us with an affidavit attesting to the fact that there's been no changes in the ownership composition um, or the business structure that would be compatible with the regulations that would render you eligible for continued certification. This is done on an annual basis. We refer to it as what's called a no change affidavit. If there are changes in the ownership or control of the business, then we ask that the uh, applicant uh, provide us with information within 10 days of that change. Um, and then we will also again do a review to determine whether or not the eligibility will continue. Um, the purposes of the, the process, once a decision is, is issued regarding the uh, professional declaration of eligibility process, uh, at some point the uh, applicant can be subject to a full scope audit to ensure that the, uh, the decision was made in compliance with the program regulations. One of the things we, we don't do here at the city is recommend, certify, or endorse any particular CPA or professional attorney uh, with regard to preparing applications for those people that are seeking certification with the city of Chicago. We do not maintain a list of recommended uh, professionals for that process. We encourage all applicants to do their due diligence and and seeking guidance, uh, so they will be consulting with the professional to determine whether or not they wish to pursue this particular process. The documentation that's normally required as part of the certification process, uh, it, it would involve a completed electronic application, which is done online. And by the way, all of our information, all of our documents are done online. The, uh, the summary form that the professional will be using, the site visit form, as well as the, the form of attestation that is downloadable at our website, and the website is shown below. Um, for purposes of the application, the applicant will also go online to complete the application and upload documents that are required, such as uh, you know, business licenses, resumes, tax returns, things of that nature. Um, the, all this information is done again online, and it's all done at the website www.chicago.mwdde.com. Some examples of the documents that we're seeking that the applicant should be expected to complete and you should be expected to review would be information that's going to identify the, the business uh, the business and its owners, identify the type of certification that they're seeking. It can be either MBE, WBE, or both if the individuals are eligible for, for, for both. Um, we look for information regarding the ownership, uh, any employees, key employees that are involved with the business, uh, facility information, such as where they're located, uh, whether or not they actually have site control over that facility. Uh, we look for information regarding uh, financial, corporate uh, tax returns and personal tax returns, and any applicable licenses that the uh, applicant might need in order to conduct business. Say, for example, uh, a firm that's seeking certification has an engineer. They would be expected to provide uh, evidence of their being licensed in the state of Illinois as a professional engineer. That would be an example license that we would look for. We look for resumes and, and as well as the professional should be looking at resumes to verify experience. Businesses are certified 
not just on the basis of being a minor, owned by a minority or and or woman. They're also based upon uh, providing a service that they have a, a knowledge and background and skill in and can control. So in the event that, again, I'm seeking a certification as an engineering firm, I would expect as the owner to have background and experience in that particular field. And I would demonstrate that or document that uh, in addition to the license that I mentioned earlier, uh, information like resumes uh, that might uh, you know, give provided or historical background of my training, um, any professional associations that I participate in, if I'm involved in certain types of trades that may involve uh, equipment such as maybe trucking, I would need to provide information regarding that, effort, that, that as well. Um, contract information that I might have that would also pertain to the type of work I'm involved in could also be submitted as part of documentation. So, like, for example, if you're if you're reviewing a firm that's involved in probably engineering services and they can provide you evidence of their work in that field by way of a contract, that would be a, a form of documentation that could be submitted uh, in that sense. Uh, additional documents that would also be required and, and downloadable uh, on our website would be the attachment one, the individual statement of ownership form itself. That's a statement that all owners of the business, no matter if you're minority owner or a non-minority owner, everyone that comprises the ownership of the business would need to complete a form like this. Um, with regard to the, the attachment for the affidavit of social disadvantage, that's a form that normally is used in the event that the individual seeking certification does not fall into the, the, the categories of eligibility as, 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 insofar as minorities. Uh, a listing of uh, eligible people that would qualify as minorities again would be uh, listed on our on our regulations. So again, go back to our regulations and then get definition of what constitutes uh, the person being part of the minority group. However, if an individual does not fit into that category, they in fact are still on an individual basis seek to be certified using what's called an affidavit of social disadvantage, which actually will again document that individual's experiences that would lead them to feel that they have been subject to a discrimination and disadvantage for purposes of eligibility, consideration of eligibility. I'm sorry. All firms that are certified under this process at some point will be uh, reviewed. Again, I mentioned audit earlier. Uh, we will go back and on, on some cases randomly or at certain points in time to review the certification decision that was made by the professional. Uh, and we look at that to determine whether or not that recommendation was made in compliance with the regulations uh, that we referenced earlier. Uh, in the event that we find that there have been um, uh, inconsistencies in, in the application and what was submitted and in, rounds in out that it's not in compliance by regulations, those businesses can be subject to the certification. Here's the part, I guess, that it sounds, it's, it, it, I cringe when I see penalties. It's, 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 there's no such thing as penalties, right? But again, there are consequences to the things that are not done in accordance with the rules. Um, and we do understand that sometimes things happen um, that are, you know, errors can, can occur in the process. Some of them could, you know, be technical, not intentional. Some of them could be perhaps intentional. Uh, we try to look at that uh, in this process, recognizing that, again, you know, it's it's not intentional or, or it, it could be circumstances behind it. Uh, errors that, that may have been made during the review process that may not affect the certification outcome are what we call kind of technical errors. And some of those errors can be quite simple. Like, for example, we require that applicants submit uh, signed tax returns. We ask for signed tax returns because we want the tax return that's been submitted to be authenticated as being the one that was submitted uh, to the IRS for a purpose of review. Sometimes we might get draft copies that were submitted that may have been changed before they were actually submitted. We might look at this as a technical area. It may not be as intentional in that it was provided without, um, without realizing that it wasn't a final copy. Um, in the event that this happens, um, you know, we try to you know, reach out to the professional to let them know that, hey, you know, we need to kind of do a little better, require the sign tax returns again, for example. Um, and even it happens uh, another time that may require uh, additional training uh, in the areas of certification where the shortcomings, shortfalls may have been to try again to, to get us to do better. 
if it continues to happen, then it's possible that the profession could lose eligibility for participation in the process. Technical errors that are determined to be intentional, however, uh, for example, submitting a, a draft copy knowing that it's not the final copy and the information may not be correct, could in, in fact uh, be the basis for the professional losing their eligibility to participate uh, in this process. Substantive errors also that could, you know, again, affect the certification outcome, but are not deemed to be intentional. Um, maybe again, after it's been determined and pointed out, it might require the professional entering into what we call a compliance integrity agreement uh, for purposes of just kind of managing this, you know, get, encouraging everyone to do best practices and to be more attentive to the process. Um, in the event that a second occurs a second time, the professional can be barred from the program and the firm that's seeking certification uh, will be decertified. Of course, all, all proposed certifications, the applicant will be offered a right to appeal, but um, a matter like this would, would have to be done on an individual basis. Uh, substantive error could very well be information that, um, let's say, may have been overlooked in an application, like a, a blank form that and that information in there uh, in, in the application that may have actually had an impact on the recommendation. Uh, and again, it was maybe just an oversight left off during the process, uh, which could very well be the basis for doing that. However, um, there are some cases where, again, those errors could be done intentionally. And likewise, if it's you know, on, on the other matters of intentional errors, uh, if it's determined that it was done to obtain certification, uh, the person can't lose eligibility. And just trying to give an example of that might be a resume that might inaccurately portray the background and skills of a, of a particular owner in an area that they're seeking to be certified in. Uh, and it was done with the intention of just trying to, to get certified. And that's, that's something that we brought in. And in cases like that, uh, we, we do reserve the, uh, the right to refer matters to our inspector general's office further review in some cases depending on again the uh the the severity of the of the error or of, of the incident could be referred to the state licensing board for further consideration or uh refer to our corporation uh, council for uh, additional attention under a city's false state ordinance how to get help in this process um we're we're here to help all those who seek to know about our program and, and those that seek to help us and, and further in our program. You can reach our office uh, at, we're at located at City Hall, 121 North South, Suite 806. You can also dial our number to 1900 choosing option number one, which will put you in uh, touch with the certification of the entity who's available to answer any questions that you might have regarding certification, as well as the professional declaration eligibility process. We want to work with you to make this work for them. So we encourage the applicant to tell the story. We encourage the professional to tell the story so that we can most certainly um, put together a, a, a certification for that will be meaningful for the business and we'll help them to grow. Pitfalls to avoid. Incomplete applications, site visits, and or summary recommendation reports. Lack of details and lack of specifics. All applications that are submitted to the city for uh, consideration go through an intake process. And what we try to do during the intake process is to make sure that the application and supporting information is complete before we even go through the process of reviewing it. Because this is a sort of, because this is a process where we're making the recommendation, um, we basically just want to make sure the application is complete. So incomplete information, we will return, uh, you know, with, along with a note basically I'm telling you what's wrong and hopefully you can, you can correct it. Some of the common errors that I've seen in the case of professionals, for example, is they'll look at our summary form and they'll just basically answer it like a yes or no, and they won't elaborate. So, and that's important for us because we need to understand how you came to your, your, your basis for your recommendation. So we encourage you to tell the story and talk about that company that you reviewed. Um, you know, what, what's the ownership conversation? What it is they do? How they do it? What's the background? And, and the strengths of the owner. Are they in control of the business? Is there, and all those things are important. So we, we do want you to tell that story um, 
and not necessarily give us a form that's going to say refer to uh, document number two or yes or no. Tell that story. That's important for us. Um, the incorrect type of application that's submitted. In many cases, in some cases, rather, I would say, uh, we've had individuals that have applied under this process that weren't professionals, uh, that thought that because they were, in fact, a professional individual, such as perhaps I, I'm a, a lawyer or I'm a, an engineer, that I can self certify. Uh, or that, that doesn't work. Um, you need to go through another process of receiving certification. Um, the correct type of application is, is important in this process. Um, but you have time to respond to request for information. This is normally a part of the review process by the professional. In fact, hopefully during your review of, of the individual's application, if there are questions that you might, additional information you might need, you're going to reach out to them and they will respond to you on a timely basis in order to allow you to proceed. Likewise, when we look at the information, if it's not complete or if there's a little bit of clarification that we might need, we'll reach out to the professional uh, to get that information. And in the event that uh, you're, you're going to be allowed so many days, let's say, for example, a total of 30 days uh, in order to respond, in the event that that doesn't occur, uh, that very well might lead to the application being closed for further consideration or subject to what's called our standard or traditional review process where the certification officer from the city will take over and make that recommendation. There is a fee for um, the MBE and WBE certification program. That fee is roughly at this time $250 and it's a success upon receipt by the city of the application. So once the city takes it in, it receives it for further review, then the client will be invoiced for the application fee and at that point in time, once the fee has been made, we'll continue with the review. In the event that the fee has not been received, that can hold up uh, or slow down the process. Just keep, it, keep that in mind. So I know I've covered a lot of territory in a short period of time. Um, any questions you might have, I'm more than happy to answer them uh, here, or if you'd like to reach me directly. Uh, again, my name is Cordell McGarry, my direct number uh, is 312-744-7666. But you can always call the uh, 744 number as well. Uh, you'll get, you might get myself, but you'll get any one of the number of certification officers that will be available to work. So that being said, I said thank you and I look for questions. Thank you so much, Cordell, for that great information. And we will take your questions in the Q&A panel at this time. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the panel. Um, okay, hold on one second. Um, all right, very nice point about unconventional errors. It might be helpful to eventually have a list of common unintentional errors. The tax return was a great example. Um, do you have to get certified as one of these professionals? And um, this person is currently an attorney and works with clients on their WBE application. So if, if I'm hearing the question correctly, uh, the question is whether or not the professional themselves need to be certified uh, as a minority or woman on business in order to participate in this program. And no, that's not required. Uh, what's required is only that you are, are serving as a professional uh, attorney or a, a CPA and that you've been practicing uh, for th at least three years and you're properly licensed with the state of Illinois. And then the last uh, question is um, also, what is the time difference between submitting an application through uh, a professional or traditional route? So but professional or versus uh, the tr traditional route. So we'll think of it like this. We, we, we endeavor to uh, make a recommendation decision within 90 days upon our receipt of a completed application with all supporting documents. So. Again, if you go through the intake process, 
uh, and you've paid your application fee, it's assigned to a certification officer, and they will try to turn it around within 90 days from that point in time. So, again, this, your, your professional is stepping into the role of the certification officer. So, basically, um, they're also spending time to process that application on behalf of their client. So, I can't speak to how long it's taken them to do it, but let's say once they completed their review and they submitted it to the city, then we will try to turn this around in an expeditious fashion. Uh, I can, can't give you a range, but I've, I've seen them done um, between the 15 to 30 days upon receipt of, of, the, of the packet of information and the recommend of, and, and a complete summary site visit and recommendation of the attorney or, or CPA. So a lot of it's going to be based upon completeness. The more complete, the more thorough the, uh, the information that's provided to us, the faster we can turn it around. All right. Um, I think that was the last question. Um, if you have anything else you would like to add at this time, uh, feel free to um, feel free to do so, um, Cordell. And I do think that there's one last comment. So after you get finished saying what you're saying, then I'll read the last comment. So. Basically, we look at this program as a, as a an added tool to help us to help small businesses by by getting them into the process uh, faster and using the best practices that are out there consistent with our regulations. So this is a great help for us as well. Um, again, firms that are certified in this program basically are certified indefinitely until there's cause that they might come about they're no longer eligible. And it's my hope that that time comes. Uh, based upon them being so successful that they're no longer eligible because they're no longer a small business in that sense. Or, so, that's, that's a good thing in, in, in that way. Um, now under this process, this process can also be used to help firms expand their certifications, uh, assuming that you're currently certified with the city already and you want to add an additional skill set. Let's say, for example, again, going back to my uh, use of the uh, business that's certified through engineering, Let's say they also want to do architecture. Uh, they can also expand into that uh, using this process as well. Again, it's all about telling the story and providing supporting information that demonstrates that the business owners you know, are eligible in terms of either gender or minority, but more importantly, that they also have the, the background and skills to be able to control the activity that they're involved in. Um, so it's a great tool that can be used for, for, for small businesses. And I think uh, uh, they agree that is that this is a very helpful um, tool, uh, and they thank you for that. Um, I think this is a great program uh, because it helps more companies uh, get certified and takes resources away from the city. Um, all right. Uh, so, I guess that is it. I want to thank our guest speaker, Cordell McGarry. And again, like Cordell said, if you have further questions, you can take them offline and send it to Cordell and he will definitely respond uh, to your question. And we thank you for attending. Uh, I sent some information through the chat on where you can find copies of the um, PowerPoint copies of uh, a recorded presentation. And uh, I also want to keep a reminder, if you're looking to uh, network with uh, government uh, professionals, we will be having our construction summit uh, in February. Uh, that will give me a great opportunity to come and hear some more of these great presentations, uh, conversations, hear from speakers, subject matter experts, and a network with the government community uh, regarding contracting opportunities. Thanks so much uh, for attending today. Uh, we say stay safe, stay well. We hope to see you soon. Uh, if not, we will definitely hope to uh, see you in uh, February. And uh, feel free to come back to other presentations. We have a few more um, before the end of the year. Thank you. Thank so you, Cordell. Exciting.